Our second reading is from Ecclesiastes chapter 9, starting with verse 7. Let us listen together for God's word. Go, eat your bread with enjoyment and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has long ago approved what you do. Let your garments always be white. Do not let oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that are given you under the sun. Because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do with your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. Again, I saw under the sun, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to the skillful, but time and chance happen to them all. For no one can anticipate the time of disaster like fish taken in a cruel net, and like birds caught in a snare. So mortals are snared at a time of calamity, and it suddenly falls upon them is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that by the power of your spirit, through your word, we might hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this is our last week in Ecclesiastes. So since we're wrapping things up today, I thought I'd run through some of the high points or the low points that we have touched on over the last few weeks. Some of the things that have been the, um, have, have constituted the argument of the book of Ecclesiastes. Everything is hevel, that's the Hebrew word, and it means vanity or emptiness or meaninglessness or it's fleeting, it's ephemeral. Everything is hevel. There's nothing to be gained in life from all of our effort and work. Riches don't bring happiness and neither does wisdom. Wisdom, Good and bad things which are appointed by God, they happen to all of us and we are merely at the mercy of time and happenstance. The world is irreparably damaged by injustice and unfairness. And God's so-called gift to us is to enjoy what we can during our brief span of life. And the best we can hope for is passing happiness. I want to show you a Calvin and Hobbes comic strip. This is the first half of it. Calvin is looking up into the night sky, staring at the stars, and there in the second panel he shouts, I'm significant! And then in the next panel, he stares at the stars some more, and then he adds, screamed, the dust speck, as the, the knowledge of his significance soaks in. I think this comic captures the tone of Ecclesiastes. It captures the spirit of Kohelet, the teacher, the, the narrator, the author of this book. He wants so badly for life to have meaning. He wants so badly, he is so desperate for significance. And yet he always comes up short. Every effort he makes, every path he journeys down uh, is, is pointless. It is empty. It is heavy. We've been dwelling with this gloom for the last few weeks here in worship. And today I'm hoping that as we look through this dark worldview of Ecclesiastes, that we might see some light on the other side, and that perhaps having spent time with Ecclesiastes, that we might see God and our lives and our neighbors in a slightly different way. Calvin can go away. So I want to do three things this morning. I want to agree with Kohelet. I want to thank him. And I want to disagree with him. So first, I want to share my point of agreement with Ecclesiastes. He says, all go to one place. All are from the dust and all turn to dust again. If Ecclesiastes as a book is a drama with characters, with players, then the main character of this story is death. Death looms large over the book 
of Ecclesiastes. Death looms large in the mind of Kohelet. He cannot seem to escape this figure of death. And death means many things to Kohelet, but primarily death is the great equalizer, the great nullifier, the, the, the one who levels the playing field, nullifies riches and wisdom and righteousness and success and joy, all of it, all of it becomes meaningless in the face of death. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and all turn to dust again. But death also makes life precious. Now those are my words, not his, but I think they're in keeping with the argument of this book. It is because death comes to all of us that we must seek what meaning can be found here and now in this life. The uh, poet Christian Wyman is a Christian himself and he is, I believe he's in his late 40s or early 50s, but he is living with terminal cancer. And he recently wrote a book, which is a stream of conscious uh, um, uh, interpretation or, or trying to come to grips with death. As he faces it inevitably, and it has, as it has come to reorient his perspective on life, and he writes this, any life that does not take account of death, that does not in one way or another hear the annihilating silence inside every sound, nullifying stillness within every action is a life that can neither harness nor redress that dark energy, which is to say, a life of which death already has possession. In our passage last week, Kohelet says that God has put a sense of past and future into our hearts. Some translations say a sense of eternity, eternity into our hearts. And we do think about Eternity, especially now as Easter is just around the corner, that day that we celebrate resurrection, we celebrate new life, life everlasting, eternal life. We think about that a lot. But it's important for us to remember why eternity, why eternal life, why everlasting life is so important to us. Why it is such a big deal, why it is worth celebrating. And that is because of the tremendous power of death. That and the incalculable value of every human life. If it were not for these two things, eternal life would be meaningless. If death were not so powerful, we would not uh, embrace and celebrate eternal life. And if it was not something that every human being, every person was in, in such deep and utter need of, we would not give it the attention that we do. The promise of eternal life was never meant to lead us to forget these things, but that is exactly what so often happens. Our eternal hope can give us a cavalier attitude in the face of death, allow us to forget the value of human life, to forget how great a tragedy is the loss of one single human life or the wasting of one single human life. And a life that does not take account of death is a life of which death already has possession. To put it another way, if we do not take death seriously, we do not know life. But if we look with, with clear eyes at this end that awaits all of us, whether we are rich or poor, sinner or saint, foolish or wise, if we look clearly at this end, and what we see is not the fearsome specter of death, but instead we are en enabled to see the rich beauty of our precarious and fragile lives. Ecclesiastes renews in us our sense of the value of life. That is where I agree with Kohelet. And now I want to thank you. I want to share a bit of our passage this morning in a paraphrase by Eugene Peterson called The Message. Here's what he writes. Seize life, eat bread with gusto, drink wine with a robust heart. Oh yes, God takes pleasure in your pleasure. Dress festively every morning, don't skimp on colors and scarves. Relish life with the spouse you love each and every day of your precarious life. 
Each day is God's gift. It's all you get in exchange for the hard work of staying alive. Make the most of each one. Whatever turns up, grab it and do it. And heartily. So I want to thank Kohelet for this. This is a kind of encouragement that we need to hear more often from Scripture. If life is precious, if it is fleeting, if life is fragile, then we have a moral imperative. I would even say a divine imperative to make the most of life. The Christian philosopher John Caputo writes this, the meaning in life, not the meaning of it, is found at the point that each day is found to be a grace. Now this is a subtle distinction, but I think it's an important one. The meaning of life is a, a big philosophical system. It's an answer to life's hardest questions, but the meaning in life is meaning found in each day, perceived as gift. That is the divine imperative of Ecclesiastes. But there is another side to this imperative, and that has to do with our neighbor. It is a sad waste of precious, limited time for each of us if we fail to to try to enjoy the good things in life, but it is utterly reprehensible for some to endure suffering that is preventable. There are so many in this world, in this nation, and even in our community who couldn't seize life if they wanted to, who have no path available to them except difficulty. And the more we reflect on the reality of death and how precious life is, the more outraged we should feel that bellies go unfilled that basic necessities remain out of reach, that this world is so full of souls who know nothing but suffering. Part of what it means for us, we who know tremendous privilege, part of what it means for us to seize life is to seize it for others who cannot, to work for a society and a world in which all are able to flourish, all are able to find meaning in life, to appreciate the rich, beauty of this precarious existence. Which brings me finally to my disagreement with Kohala. The passages we looked at this morning, they are his reflection on injustice. He looks around at the world and he sees injustice, he sees unfairness, he sees no difference between how the righteous and the wicked are treated. He summarizes this most succinctly in two places, not in our passages. First, in chapter 1, he says this, what is crooked cannot be made straight. And he says it again later in chapter 7. He puts perhaps a finer point on it. He says this, consider the work of God. Who can make straight what God has made crooked? So there it is. He lays it at the feet of God. The injustice that we experience, that we witness around us, he lays at the feet of God. This turns out, I think, to be his biggest blind spot. Remember the advent promise of the prophet? In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be filled in and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all people shall see it together. Kohelet looks around and he sees what we all see. A broken world. An unjust, unfair world. A world that does not permit straightforward answers for the things that happen. And he concludes sensibly that it can't be fixed. We might be tempted to draw the same conclusion if if we were not standing on the other side of Advent, on the other side of the Incarnation, if we did not have the benefit of looking at the world through the lens of what God has done in Christ. Because this is precisely what Jesus promised in His life, in His ministry, in His, His teaching, that the world as we know it, the world that we see outside, this world that is unfair and unjust and broken, that the world as we know it will be turned 
on its head. What is fractured will be made whole. What is incomplete will be made perfect. What is broken will be restored. What is crooked will be made straight. He called this the kingdom of God. So for me, as I have studied and, and, and spent time with Ecclesiastes, the kingdom of God has become my grain of salt that I use to season this book. The lens through which I read Ecclesiastes and his despair and his, his honest thought. Now, some say that the problem with Ecclesiastes, the problem with Kohelet, is that he doesn't know Jesus. He doesn't know that in Jesus we have been offered eternal life. And if only he knew Jesus, he would, he would, he would uh, sing a different tune. He would write a completely different book. And so he is dismissed. His honest assessment of life and its challenges is simply dismissed. But if we dismiss everyone in the Bible who doesn't know Jesus, we're left with only the New Testament. I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think that Kohelet has so much to teach us. I think there's a lot here that can challenge us. And there certainly are some things here that can inspire us. I don't think his problem is that he didn't know New Testament theology. I think his problem is that he lacked imagination. And that is a problem that we all share with him. He is unable to comprehend. As he looks out on the world, he is unable to comprehend that God can do the impossible. The basic assumption of Ecclesiastes is this. What is crooked cannot be made straight. And that is where Kohelet and I disagree. Because that is precisely the purpose of Jesus' life and His ministry. It is precisely the purpose of the Spirit's continued work in the world. It is precisely the purpose of this body gathered here together, the church, called to bear witness to the kingdom. To show the world that the way things have always been is not the way that they will always be. To show the world that one day what is crooked in our hearts, what is crooked in this world, will be made straight. Let us pray. God, may we cherish life. May we seize life and help others to do the same. And may we have the imagination to see the good news of your kingdom made real in this world. In Christ's name we pray.